This is not a triple session. I don't think I'm going to be mentioning triple even once after the introduction. Uh, so if, if that's a bother for you, I won't be offended if you walk out now, but I do encourage you to stand. My name is David Garfield. You may know me online as Krell or as Krell the Dancing Crab. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter during the session, that's where you do so. I highly encourage it. <laughs> I'm a senior architect with Palatine.net. We're a consulting agency based in Chicago, the United States. Uh, there's also the Web Services League, which we will eight. Uh, the group representatives in the Premier of Interoperability Group. And as you may have noticed, I uh, am a walking implementation of PSR 8. Those of you who are at jam session this morning uh, should get that joke. So I'd like to start with today. He's talking about biology, specifically human stomach. Stomach is a rather important part of human digestion. The process of digestion in the stomach and our, in our intestines uh, breaks down the food we eat and produces calories and other nutrients. It makes them, it's the process of breaking down food into raw material that we can use. <clears throat> but like any other process, it also consumes energy to do. So we have to spend calories in order to get calories, in a sense. <clears throat> Back when humans lived in days, uh, at best. Our diet was mostly plants. Meat was hard to come by because hunting animals was hard and dangerous when you didn't have you know, fairly advanced technology. And the part of the problem though is plants are actually rather hard for humans to digest. Our stomachs are not well suited to digesting plant matter. So when we eat food, especially plants, we're burning an awful lot of calories you try and break down this very tough material to get nutrients out of them. So on net, when we eat, we don't get a great deal of energy out of it. We have to eat more to get the same amount of energy. And our stomachs have to work very hard to break down that food to get calories and other nutrients out of them. This started to change with the development, with the domestication of fire. This is I'm not quite sure exactly when humans started domesticating fire, depending on you know, which archaeologist you ask. It could be anywhere from 400,000 years ago to a million years ago. We started domesticating fire. Now, this is a little sketchy of how this happened. Best guess is it started by you know, capturing something that was already burning and just keeping it lit uh, by just feeding it more wood over time. Eventually, we learned how to uh, start our own fires. And there were a lot of things you could do as you know, primitive humans with fire. The most important for our purposes today was cooking. Somewhere around 250,000 years ago, give or take, humans started using fire to cook food. What does it mean to cook food? It means using the fire to break down the food before we eat it. It means starting the digestion process over a fire, rather than waiting for it to, to get into our mouths and into our stomachs. This means that the process of breaking down the food has already started before it gets into our stomach. Our stomachs have to do less work now to get the same amount of nutrients out of the same amount of food. It means, in a sense, outsourced digestion to fire. 
we let a tool do a job for us. What that meant was we suddenly had a surplus of calories available. And evolutionary pressure that cal those calories can get used elsewhere. Where do they get used? Well, they can get used by the brain. Wrong brain. Bad brain. I guess the joke plays better in the United States, doesn't it? <laughs> if with the same amount of food that we take in, we need to spend fewer calories digesting our next meal, that's more calories that we can spend thinking. That's more calories that we can put towards more powerful brains. And over time, the human brain evolved to be more complex, more advanced, more capable. We got smarter by making tools do our work for us. Biologically, humans became smarter by, make, by inventing a tool, in this case, a campfire, that can do our work for us. That is the history of human evolution and human advancement, is finding something that we don't want to do and making a tool do it for us. What's a computer? A computer is a tool for doing repetitive, boring, rote work with information so that we don't have to. The exact same process applies. How do you advance as a developer? How do you advance as a person? How do we advance as a species? By making our tools do our job for us. Now, everyone in this room is a developer, I assume, right? That's why you're here? I hope so. So what is our job? Our job is to write code, right? Wrong. Our job is to write correct code. I can churn out code all day very quickly. It's just going to be totally garbage and not actually solve a problem. We want to correct code that does not have errors in it. That is our goal. That is our job as developers, is to produce error-free code, or as error-free as we can manage. So if we want to be smarter about our jobs, we make tools that produce error-free code for us, or tools that will find errors for us so that we don't have to. You are a smart person. You are an intelligent human being. You're, you should be spending your brain on business problems, on, on real problems, not on debugging. I've got better things to do with my time than debug. I want the computer to debug for me. I will just go solve the problem for my client instead. This process, <clears throat> there are lots of ways to have a tool find bugs for us in programming. One of the most powerful is a very broad topic called static analysis. Who's heard this term before? A few people? Okay. Static analysis, in a general sense, is looking at the code without executing it and saying, I can tell there's a problem here just by looking at it. Without actually executing the code, I can look at it statically, that is, without executing it, and say, there's a bug. I should go fix that. But if you can look at it, and say, bug. Your tools can look at it and go, bug, for you, and you don't have to spend the time doing so. What we want to do then is make it as easy as possible for our tools to find those bugs for us. Now, when I say tool here, what do I mean? Could be anything. Could be the PHP engine itself. It could be your IDE. It could be some separate tool that you run over your code base. <clears throat> it could be your documentation tool, like PHP doc. Our, what we want to do is figure out how we can pre-digest our code so that we can spend our brains on the hard problems. At a basic level, you've probably heard this I mentioned before, you should be developing under EAL. In PHP, you can change the error level that your code runs at anywhere from hide all errors to scream and rant and rave about errors. You should always be developing under EAL. I hope I don't have to actually convince anyone of this at this point. Uh, people adopted EAL uh, standards a long time ago. EAL is P the PHP error level for whining about every little nitpick because I want to know. Why is that important? Who can tell me what the major problem is with this code? Anyone? Got, you know, require the set of form tools, check if the user is in 
demonstrator, if it is, it's a admin, and then we check that value here. Yeah. If it is not an admin, then this value never gets set. So is this value then going to not be set down here? Maybe. What happens inside form tools? Did form tools happen to be a variable called is admin? Maybe. With EL, we get an error saying, dude, this variable isn't initialized yet, or may not be initialized yet, which means you may have a bug here. You may have a security hole. Fix it now. Certainly, there's plenty of other issues in this code, but I want to keep the specific bug simple. How do we fix that? Nice and simple. Just always make sure that this admin is defined. Never let yourself have an undefined value. In this case, we want our <clears throat> our runtime, we want PHP to show errors for us. Showing errors that even things that may or may not be a bug highlights sloppy code. Sloppy code is a great source of bugs. If you have your tool yell at you for sloppy code and you fix it, you have fewer sources of bugs. Great. Another tool in this department, PHP Nest Detector. It's a uh, Nice little tool. I'm pretty sure this is one of the tools written by Germans because almost all of the tools in PHP that tell you that your code is wrong was written by Germans. Go figure. And it is a static analyzer. You run it over your code and it tries to find sloppy practices. Things like, are your methods too long by some definition of too long? Do you have a too high to sigma map complexity or n path complexity? Do your classes have too many methods? So you, there's lots of dials you can play with to decide what's is an acceptable threshold for these things. This is a great tool to say, you know, I want to look at my code, find things that are sloppy, because sloppy is a source of bugs. And then fix the problems it complains about, and you have fewer places that bugs can occur. We can also make it easier on our tools by adding extra information to analyze. Can we add code in such a way that bugs become even more obvious. Good code makes bugs obvious. How do we do that? We can include metadata about our code in the code itself. We can have an approximate junior version of our code that we write alongside the code itself that allows a static analyzer to just look at it and say, wow, there's a bug here. It's very obvious from your annotated kind of junior version that there's a bug. How does that work? Well, we've got a function here that takes two values and it adds up their squares. Fairly simple. What are the possible return values of this function? Basically infinite. Technically, there's a limit with PHP and Axiom, but that's a couple of billion on most systems, so effectively it's infinite. But if we can approximate this, and say all of the numbers we pass in are going to be positive, negative, zero, or um. Every integer is positive, negative, zero, or n. N is actually English. So now we can predict what the possible uh, returns are here. Because there's only four possible values, and we know exactly how those interact. So positive times positive is going to be positive. Uh, positive times zero is zero, and negative times zero is zero. We can just list out all of the possible permutations in our kind of abstracted junior version of this function. Which means, what do we know about this return value? Well, A and B are going to be positive or negative. A, and if A is positive, positive times positive is positive. B, and if uh, it's negative, negative times negative is also positive. So we're always going to be adding two positive values. Two positive values added together will always be positive. Therefore, we know that the results of this function will always be positive. I can prove to you mathematically that this function will never return a negative number. <clears throat> and the only way it can return zero is if both A and B are zero. Now, we just went through this and did it on our heads. It's fairly simple. But again, this is simple rote process 
I've got better things to do with my time than simple growth process. Why not make our tools do it for us? Let's take another example. We've got two functions here, bigger and compute, to do some you know, fairly basic uh, contrived arithmetic. Uh, the first one is going to return either the first value or zero. And the second one is going to do some routine math. And then we call compute with the result of calling bigger as, the, as a C here. Okay. What do we know about this code just by looking at it? If V or C, now that we're dividing here, we know that anything times zero is zero. And dividing by zero breaks. Which means that the value uh, message for C from bigger is that zero, our code is going to break. <coughs> How can that be zero? If y is larger than x, this will return zero. <coughs> so we can work back and say, here's the situation in which this code is going to fail. Because math. Let's try changing it. In this case, we're turning a string in either case, the first or the second, and then pass that into compute. Now what do we know? We know that this will always be wrong. Without running it, I can tell you, this code is wrong. Why? Because a string times a string does not make the slightest bit of sense. Except in PHP, where a string passed into an integer like this uh, parses the digits off the first part of the string. In this case, there aren't any. Therefore, these will, you know, whatever comes back from bigger is going to get passed to a zero. And as we saw, zero down here in the denominator is going to blow up. Therefore, even though PHP tries to give us an integer, this code will still always fail. Let's try putting this abstract information into the code itself. Later, is going to take two numbers. We're going to insist that they're numbers. And compute is going to take three numbers and return a number. This is not actual PHP code here, but it's close enough. Just looking at it, I can tell you this may or may not work. Sometimes it will fail completely, and sometimes it will return the value you expect. In this case, this is going to return a string, but this is expecting a number. I just know, by looking at just those, I know it's going to break. I don't even have to look at the bottom of the function. I know this wants to, this can give me a string, this wants a number, that's a mismatch, fail. It becomes even easier for me or a tool to say, hey, look, look. On the other hand, if we change it so we're always between one or two, then <clears throat> this returns a number, this takes a number, and I'm not going to have a fatal error. I can prove to you I have no fatal error here. Your tools can help you with this. Your tools can find these issues for you if you help them. If you give your tools the right information, they can find bugs for you. They can do half your job for you better than you can. And what we're talking about here is the idea of type systems. That's the, the point of this talk, is type systems. What is a type system? It's actually kind of hard to define, because the software engineering world and computer science world have been using the term type system in two completely different ways for 70 years. The best generic uh, definition I've seen is this one. A type system is a tractable syntactic method for proving the absence of certain program behaviors by classifying phrases according to the kind of value they compute. We're going to, to classify portions of our code based on the kind of value we're dealing with and use that to prove that certain issues do not exist and cannot exist. Put another way, it's metadata about our code that we can analyze to find bugs without actually executing it. <clears throat> there are lots of different types of type systems. I could give an entire college course on this subject. Actually, I couldn't, but there are people who could. <laughs> so let's just go very, very basic. You may have heard a lot of these terms before. Static types are types defined ahead of time in your source code <clears throat> that the compiler can analyze and do something with. Dynamic typing 
is derived by the compiler or by the runtime on the fly. These are not mutually exclusive. A lot of people you know, get up in arms about, oh, this language is static, this language is dynamic. Those are not inherently mutually exclusive. They could be explicit, which means that the source code itself contains this information, or they could be implicit, where you can look at something and say, oh, this function, the only return statements have an integer, therefore, the function is going to return an integer, therefore, something else that calls it returns its results is going to return an integer. That's implicit typing, uh, also known as type inference, because the, the system can infer the type of data off of your source code. Also, the idea of strict types, where a variable can change type only through an explicit process where you tell it, hey, I'm changing type, or weak types, where depending on the context, the type of variable can shift. And different languages have that uh, shifting done in different ways. <clears throat> the word here that I'm not using is strong typing. Strong typing means type system that I like. It doesn't actually have any academic value. So let's look at types in PHP and how they can help us improve our code and avoid bugs. Right. So we've got the piece of code here, a function called uh, compute shipping from some source destination, say our warehouse, in this case this is Palantir's address back in the United States. Uh, I'm going to ship to some user and I'm going to pull the user's address off and calculate the distance between these two addresses by some mechanism and I'm going to say it's uh, 50 cents per kilometer. It's nice and, nice and basic. What's the bug here? Is there a bug here? Is that, is that misspelled? Is address misspelled? Maybe. Anyone familiar with the HTTP spec? <laughs> that HTTP header is misspelled. The spec is wrong in terms of its spelling. But everybody uses the incorrect spelling because that's what it says in the spec. So just because I have only one S here doesn't guarantee that that's actually wrong. It probably is. Someone probably screwed up somewhere, but not necessarily. Another uh, good example I like here. The word canceled. Does it have one L or two? What's that? Can't hear you? It depends. Correct. Whether cancel has one L or two depends on what dialect of English you're talking about. In American English, both are valid. Go figure. So if you have a property, uh, like a, uh, an array key called cancel, do you know whether it has one L or two? Which one is right? I have no idea. So let's assume for now that that is a bug, and it should be uh, two S's. OK. Would that field even defined? For that matter, is user even an array? I'm using it like it's an array, but is it actually an array? Uh, me? I don't know. Oh, no, it's actually an integer. I'm passing in the user ID. So this will break mysteriously right here. Now, if we uh, type inference, some languages do, it could find this for us, but PHP does not do type inference, so we're on our own. So let's explicitly say we want an array. Pass me an integer. PHP itself will yet yell at you. Your IDE will yell at you for trying to pass in an integer. Of course, is address, is address property on this user array defined? Maybe. I need to do error checking for that. That's more code I need to run. Nope. User is in fact an array with an ID property and no address. So it can still be wrong. Bottom line here. PHP arrays make absolutely awful data structures because they provide absolutely no type information. I cannot verify statically that I have a bug or that I don't have a bug. I have to guess. This is why arrays make horrible, horrible data structures in PHP. How do we fix that? By not using an array for a data structure. <laughs> Let's use a class. PHP doesn't have structs as their own thing, so we just use classes. <clears throat> Let's keep it basic. Two properties on it, ID and address. So yeah, it looks like two S's is what we want. And we know that those are the only two properties. And now we say this has to be a user 
objects here. And so we create a user object and pass it in. And now we know that it's going to be an address field. And we know that the address property exists. Well, we know that the type, the property is defined, but it could still be null, or maybe a string, or I don't know what it is. Um, okay, address is uh, an array. Good. Is an array what distance between us? I don't know. Distance between doesn't tell me what it wants either. So there's, there could still be a bug here. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Let's go ahead and make address an actual object too. It's a, a struct. So we've got our user, and it's going to take an address. So passing it to the constructor, we have to give it an address object. Address is just four properties, so street, city, state, and zip. <coughs> zip, zip code, um, American Postal Code, sorry. And then, uh, so now we can statically tell that we're not getting an error here because distance between wants two addresses and compute shipping takes a user and we know that that address should be, at the time we create it, an address object. And okay, so we create our address object, we create our user, and pass it along to compute shipping. Great, so now I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna have an obvious basic bug here. Unless someone changes the ad value of the user's address property in here somewhere before I start using it. PHP doesn't put types on properties, and it's very sad. You cannot put types on properties. So I can't guarantee that someone hasn't changed a this address property to a string, or to some other type of object, or to an integer, or to a float. I float. No idea, but there's no way that you can prevent that from happening. How do we solve that? With a method. Now our user takes an address, so the, the, the properties are now protected, so they can't be changed really minimally. And our constructor takes an address, and that address returns, whoa, whoa, what's this? Did people see this before? We're going to explicitly specify a return type, so that get address can only ever return an, an address object. So now I know that it comes back from get address, this variable, will be an address object. I can guarantee it. I can mathematically prove it will be an address object. This gives us that level of type safety, so we know exactly the type of data we're dealing with at any given time. And if you know the shape of your data, you know, there's a huge swath of error handling you can just ignore because you know there's going to be a get address method and it's going to give me back an address object. I can guarantee this, so I don't need to worry about error handling around it might not be an address, it might be missing some part of it. I don't have to worry about that. So let's talk about that colon. Return types. New feature in PHP 7. Who's worked with PHP 7 yet? A few people. Within a month, I want all of you working with PHP 7, and here's why. Any method or any function in PHP 7 may now specify a return type, which means that that function or that method may only return variables of that type. They are not null, which means you cannot return null in place of that object. If we specify an address there, then an address object is the only thing that can be returned, not even null. It must always be an instance of address. And if you have a code path that produces something else, that's a bug. And it will get caught right there where the actual bug is, not 400,000 lines of code later somewhere in form API where it tells you that you're iterating something that's not an array. And you go, what? <laughs> not that this has ever happened to me. Why is this good? Who's done something like this before? We have some kind of object, and we're going to look up a, a, a user by an ID. We're going to call get address, and we call street, uh, get street, and we run this code, and we get an error method called a non-object. 
And now you sigh and add a dozen if statements to your code to check if everything returns a null in each place. And this one line of code turns into about eight, maybe 10. And this is gross. But if you type the return of these methods to a certain object, that is all that will come back. I know that I cannot have this you know, method called a non object nonsense because I know I'm going to get back an, a, an object of that instance, or of that class. It will still blow up, but it will blow up in the right place because that function, one of those methods, returned the wrong thing. And it's the one that has an error, not me, and that should be fixed. So, how do you do error handling? You can't return nulls on user not found or address not found, what do you do? There's two options here, exceptions and empty values. Which you use is kind of use case dependent. My recommendation, if you have a service object like a repository, <clears throat> throw an exception. If you're saying find the user by ID and it should return a user object and it can't, it's the that is an error case. That is an edge case. It is violating its contract. It cannot fulfill its contract. Throw an exception. Because quite frankly, the code around this, around this call, is not going to work anyway if there's no user. It's just going to break one or another, break in the right place. For a value object, you have an empty value. Strings have an inherent empty value of an empty string. Objects, you're on your own to define an empty value. But you can do that fairly easily. Is this way to do that? To make an interface? You're always making interfaces, right? Good. And then you have an empty implementation that does whatever logically makes sense for an empty implementation. In this case, I'm just going to return a string for everything. And then I have a, a real address object that does whatever. What, what's that could be? There's a use case, but it's that's still better than null, because null means I don't know what to do and I'm going to give up. This way we're actually providing meaningful value back. Incidentally, if you have a function that is returning false on an error and the other values of returns on success is not true, you're wrong. Because this inherently undermines your type expectations. If I expect back a user object, what does false mean? I, False is not a type of user object. I do not want to know what this means. I cannot comprehend this statement. I have to guess. Don't make people guess. It means I have to throw a whole bunch of other if statements around my code to figure out what you're talking about. Don't do that. You want your type system to be able to catch errors for you. If I have to throw a whole bunch of if statements around my code to figure out what you're giving me back, you're making me do extra work. Stop it. So that's return types. In PHP 7, you want to use them a lot. So where were we? Okay. So we've got our class for user. And this can take an address interface here. This object can turn the address interface. Could be an empty, could be a real value. Uh, for compute shipping, we're actually going to type that as well to make sure that we get the, uh, the right object we want because this provides extra protection. <clears throat> we can verify what a user means, because we have a defined class for it. Uh, distance between, we know exactly the type it needs, an address to an address. <clears throat> and we can have our tools verify this for us. If we try to pass something that's not an address or not a user, we can get an error exactly at the right place. An IDE can just look at the code and show us a little red squiggly line and say, dude, wrong, fix it which means I can remove a lot of error checking code that I no longer need, because the language syntax itself is my error checking code. Of course, what we, all we need open user is the address. So now that we see all the types, now that we see the actual structure of the data we're dealing with, it becomes painfully obvious that all we need to do is pass two addresses in to compute shipping. And we can just get the user address off here, or it makes more sense. Could we have made that change before? Sure. Is it painfully obvious now that we have an explicit definition of what our data structures are? Yes. <clears throat> so let's look at this in between. What's it returning? Well, we're doing some math on it, or 
yeah, we're doing some math on it here. So it's probably a number of some kind, but is that going to be an, an integer or a float? In this case, it's not going to matter a great deal, but it's still good to know which one we're dealing with. And I've got to know. Let's just tell the system. Oh, looks like compute shipping is going to return a float. The distance between is going to return an integer. Because you know, we'll just round up if it's uh, a fraction of a kilometer. That way we can be greedy and charge more. And, and <laughs> integer and float. We can type on scalars now? Yes, we can. Welcome to PHP 7. Also known as, if you ever meet Andrea Falls or Anthony Ferrara at a conference, you owe him a drink. One of these is European, the other is American. Or maybe they're American, I'm not sure. But if you ever run into these people, you owe them a drink. Because this is the most awesome feature in all of PHP 7, is the type system. As of PHP 7, you can now type variables as int, float, string, or bool in uh, either return or in the, uh, a parameter to a function or method. Not integer or boolean, int and bool. There was some discussion about that, but it has to be int and bool. Which means you can type, you know, this is the full type list now for PHP 7, <coughs> int, float, string, bool, array, callable, or any class name as you define. And you can put this up on any parameter or any return on any function or method. And I encourage you to do it a lot. Why? Let's take a look at that address interface. <clears throat> uh, get street. What does that return? Is, that, is the street going to be a string? Or is it going to be another object that has a street name, a street number, an apartment number? Which is better? Depends on your use case. Either one is completely valid. Which one are you going to do? We need to tell the system. We need to tell other developers which it's going to be. Oh, it's a string. I'm going to type as a string, and I now know exactly what I'm going to get back. I know the shape of my data. My compiler knows the shape of my data. <clears throat> then, in my address object, I can say, all right, these all have to be strings when I pass them in. And I, the methods to get them are all strings. So now I know it's a collection of strings. Always. Every time. If it's something that does not look like a string, it means there's a bug. And that becomes painfully obvious there's a bug before my code even shifts. So we create a user and then try to compute shipping. What's the error here? Who knows what's wrong with this code? So the Americans might know this better. Numbers. I'm using numbers here for the postal codes. American postal codes are a five-digit numeric string, not a five-digit number. In parts of the country, we do have postal codes that mean zeros. What happens when you have a number, a little of literal in PHP that begins with a zero? It's an octal, right? which means it shows up in base 8, which means what we've just passed in is not 02113, it's the number 1099, which is not a valid postal code. Of course, you know, by default then, that'll just pass through, and you'll save that to the database, and the value will get right out a month later, and you'll try to compute something off of it, and your uh, shipping computation will explode horribly, and you'll have no idea why, because you've got bad data in your database. Where did it come from? <coughs> it's a mystery. So how do we handle this? This was the biggest dispute in the PHP 7 type system. Is how do we handle cases where normally PHP traditionally would say, eh, it's close enough, I know how to convert between strings and ints. But we may not want it to for exactly this reason. The, this was the introduction of strict and weak modes in PHP 7. It is weak by default. In weak mode, if, if you just start typing stuff in PHP 7, and you're in weak mode, <clears throat> variables will cast the way you expect, the way that you're used to. If something looks like a string or looks like an end, it will more or less work. Pass a, you know, a, a num a integer to a string, it'll turn into a, a string. Pass a string to a number, it'll work. With the caveat of 
if you uh, would truncate the values that way, if you have a string 1, 2, 3, A, B, C, and you pass that to an int, it'll generate the notice because you probably have an error there. PHP is always the fault of this kind of automatic coercion for the simple reason that on the web everything is a string. All the data coming from the database is a string. All the data coming from HTTP is a string. So forcing you to explicitly cast all that stuff is just a huge pain. So by default, everything is <coughs> weak mode. Problem. This undermines type checking. Exactly like we just saw. We pass an integer to a string. It doesn't catch the fact that it's the wrong integer. So you can force your code instead into strict mode by putting this declaration at the top of your file. And then that file, and only that file, is now a strict mode. Strict mode turns off all that automatic conversion and says, oh, you're going to try and return a, st a string here? If it's not a string, if it's an integer that looks like a string, no, it must be a string. The variable must be a string or PHP will throw a type error. Which means PHP can spot this, it means your IDE can spot this, it means PHP message detector can spot this. All of your tooling can very easily spot this value, this <coughs> error. But it affects only calls and returns from this file. It is completely opt in. From this file. I am returning from this file, so this will get picked up and I'll get an error if I return the wrong thing. The constructor is called from elsewhere, so it does not affect that. <coughs> However, we come over here to where we have our buggy address, we declare strict types here. <coughs> our constructor now, we're going to pass in an int, it's expecting a string, it's going to, and we're saying, PHP, please be extra picky on my types, and PHP will flag this. Your IDE can flag this and say, this is an integer, you, you're supposed to give it a string, no, fix it. It affects just the calls in this file. This makes it really easy to opt in portions of your code to extra pedantic mode. And means someone else's decision to do so does not affect your code. This is great. In strict mode, the only cast that happens is if you pass an int to something that expects a float, it'll work. Because that is a almost universally safe conversion to make. There's almost no way that that can have a uh, data loss error. And I say almost because when you're dealing with obscenely large numbers in the billions, then there can be some uh, runoff errors there. But that's an issue that exists in almost every language. And you're unlikely to run into that in practice with Drupal. Here, here we go, a Drupal mention. If you want to have a uh, value uh, convert otherwise, you have to explicitly cast it yourself by putting parentheses and a type before it. Or really redesign your code. Because if you have that kind of type dispatch, it means you haven't thought through your problem space. It means you don't know the type of data you're dealing with, which means you probably have bugs in your logic, not just your code. By putting PHP into strict mode, you are telling it, debug not just my code, debug my business assumptions. Because if I don't know the type of data I'm dealing with, I'm probably going to do something wrong. I'm probably going to get it wrong. I want my tools to catch this for me. So when should you use strict types? I would argue almost always. If you're writing PHP 7 code, pretty much always opt into strict mode because it lets the compiler, it lets the engine, it lets your IDE find bugs for you. It lets it do your job. The one caveat to that is when you're dealing with input. Because as we said, pretty much everything coming into your system is going to be a string. But if you then pass that string to something that expects an int in weak mode, it'll say, okay, I'll take it, convert it to an integer, I'll convert it to a float, whatever. And now it's the right type. And then you can uh, get into strict mode and keep the type uh, consistent for us. The way. <coughs> this gives you the most type safety, <clears throat> gives you the most feedback, gives you the most batting for your buck in terms of the system finding errors for you. This will also yell at you for code you're probably used to writing. That's good. 
strong typing, strict typing drives good design. Because if you have a function that can return one of a couple of different types, how do I know what to do with the return value? I don't. I have to sit there and guess which one I got back and hope I got it right, which is a lot more code I have to write, a lot more guesswork, which means bug source. You want predictable types to save code. When you push your logic into your, t your uh, data structures, a lot of bugs, a lot of errors, a lot of problems simply disappear. It's also a bit more documentation. Who's heard the phrase, good code is self-documenting, you don't need to comment your code? Who's heard that phrase? <clears throat> Most of you. Anyone who says that and is not using uh, static type information in their code in strict mode is a hypocrite. Period. Dot blocks can go out of date. This stuff can't because the, the code itself will be wrong and it will give you an error and you will update it. Which means now your code is self-documenting because I am saying I am taking this type of data and transforming it to this type of data. I'm taking this input and giving me this output. Very explicitly, here's the data structure, here's the shape of data you're dealing with. And if you find yourself with the wrong shape of data, that error becomes painfully obvious. Painfully obvious errors are easy to fix. <laughs> now it's not a silver bullet. I'm not saying that this will solve all of your problems. Having types to find, find bugs. Many types of bugs. Many is not all. Just like testing does not solve all of your problems. <clears throat> types do not solve all of your problems. They can have false positives. So you have uh, two classes, thing one and thing two, both of which have a help cat method. And I can pass, you know, uh, this cat and hat method expects thing one. If I were to give it thing two, it should work. It seems like it would work, but the type system will still reject it. Type checking will reject valid programs. That's okay because you want to be extra picky. So I'm sure someone's saying, oh, that's why you don't use typing. You just use testing. I hear this a lot in the Ruby world. Who needs types? You've got testing. Except tests do not show your code is right. It just shows that there is a bug. All testing does is check for a bug you know to look for. Is that enough? Testing will accept invalid programs. You can have a horribly buggy program that still passes all of your tests. Testing establishes an upper bound on correctness, while a formal proof is your lower bound. And the more you do of each, the narrower is the range that you may or may not have a bug in. Typing is a form of automated proof. Typing is a way of proving your code does or does not have certain issues. Actually, excuse me, the way of proving your code does not have certain issues that you can tell without having to write. My recommendation, type first and then write tests. Because when you type your code, well not none, however, you still need to write tests. But with typing, you need to do less. Which means we have now outsourced testing to our language syntax. We are now using our language itself to avoid needing to write as many tests. We're using our language itself to find bugs for us. We're using our language itself to force us into good practices that are inherently less prone to having bugs in them. We're using our language syntax to help us think through what this, the structure of our business logic is and think through what our, the data we're dealing with is. That's using your brain. That's smart. That's an advanced uh, breed of human being. Save your brain for the real work. Let your language do the boring stuff. Let your tools do the boring stuff. Save your line, your code for doing the actual business logic that you're actually getting paid for. Thank you. I will be posting these slides uh, probably later tonight, tweeting them from the at Feral account. <clears throat> uh, some further reading I do recommend. Uh, book Understanding Computation by Tom Stewart. Those two, uh, I actually borrowed a lot of these examples from that book. Uh, what to know before debating type systems uh, by Chris Smith. 
And I did a two-part series for uh, Zen on their blog on uh, typing into PHP 7. Questions? How much of this can be used in Contrib? Core obviously does not use any of this um, uh, the scalar typing or return typing. So I, I'll answer it this way. Having uh, typed objects, you can do in Contrib, for the love of God, do so. Using type, structured typed objects over arrays, you can do today, you can do for years, do so in Contrib and Core everywhere. The uh, PHP 7 specific functionality, if you use it, your code is going to be tied to PHP 7. If you want, if you're okay with your module being PHP 7 dependent, you can do that. Uh, you cannot, if you're extending uh, an interface or you're an interface from core, you can't add the type information to the interface. If it's your own interface, yeah, if you're okay with a PHP 7 dependency, go ahead and use it. it it'll be fine. Other questions? <laughs> Is Drupal 4 completely compatible with PHP 7? Drupal 8 is 100% test coverage compatible with, Drupal, with PHP 7. Uh, we actually got that right before PHP 7 was released, actually just before Drupal 8 was released. Uh, and in fact, we delayed the release of PHP 7 by about two weeks because we kept finding bugs in PHP 7. Uh, because Drupal is the, the uh, regression test suite for PHP's array handling. Uh, Drupal 7 is not completely PHP 7 compatible. It's almost completely compatible. I think there are people running it. We just don't have full test uh, coverage. Uh, I would say within the next point release or two, it probably will be. If you're running Drupal 8, though, go up to PHP 7. Um, I, not to get uh, too deep into PHP 7, the typing stuff is great. It's also 50% performance improvement just by upgrading. If you're running Drupal 8, run it on PHP 7. End of story. We're not talking about that anymore. Just do it. Other questions? All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, please do rate the session online. Uh, like I said, I will be tweeting the links to the slides uh, later today. Uh, actually, they're already up, so I can uh, tweet them right after the session. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks,